Hi everyone. Uh, I think the theory is that you should be able to hear me right now. Uh, uh, welcome to Astronomy 320. I see we have uh, 23 people who have joined the Zoom so far. Uh, and I'll give people a couple more minutes to just hop on in uh, and then we'll uh, launch off across the universe at a uh, moderate pace. Um, question came up about whether I would like cameras on or off. I think uh, it's always nice to see people, but I also understand you could be in a situation where you don't really want to turn your camera on. So I'm none too choosy about that. Um, and I think we'll just, uh, we'll give it a couple more minutes. I'm setting up some audio over here. You're gonna... All right. Uh, yeah, cool. So, there we are. Um, okay. As you're coming in, if you haven't gone on to the e-class and hit the Discord invite link, uh, that'll hop you over into our Discord. And then when I am talking, you'll get a little roll up like this. And then you can put your channel questions into the lecture questions channel of Discord. Or you can say this is a test question. And it'll pop up over here, and I'll be able to see it on the Discord. Uh, the nice thing about that as we get going is that uh, two things can happen. First, if you have a question, you can give it uh, a thumbs up, and you're like, hey, that was a good question. I'm also completely confused about that. Uh, if you also watch a video asynchronously, you can post questions here, and then we can get around to answer it. Uh, and then we'll uh, go ahead and do that. So that means that if you are uh, going uh, nuts, then you know it's it's uh, you know catching up things. So we got a question here. It's popping in. What is the e poll code? Uh All right, uh, I want to say welcome to everybody who's uh, joining me here on Astro 320. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm your professor for this semester, uh, and so I hope that you uh, have a great time here in this class. This is a first for me in a lot of ways. It is a first because this is the first time that I've ever been teaching Astronomy 320. It is also a first because this is the first time I've ever taught an online class in any form, which is crazy. I was on sabbatical last year. And so that meant that uh, I completely missed like the whole COVID thing. Uh, which was, uh, well, I mean, we're still in it, but I didn't have to go through the year of that. So I went on sabbatical right as we left uh, classes in March of 2020. I was lab director at the time, so I wrote the full first year lab curriculum into online, and then I disappeared for a year. And my limited understanding is that was a great year to disappear for. Um, I spent my time that time sitting right here in this desk, uh, working on various research. And uh, yeah, so it was a wonderful, uh, refreshing time there. I did do some completely uh, stereotypical COVID pandemic things. Uh, based on some recommendations from my spouse, we got a puppy. And so if you see a dog come in here and walk around behind me or jump up into my lap, that is Rigel. Rigel is a, uh, yeah, he, he, he will grace us with his presence at some point or another. Uh, the other thing I did is I learned how to make sourdough bread because, you know, that's what every cliched uh, person does during a pandemic. So uh, those two things are how I spent the time, that and a lot of astrophysics research. So. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's hop on into uh, the notes. I want to get things started by noting that I am recording all of our online lectures, and maybe I'll be able to work out a way to do this in person as well. Uh, the way I've set it up is I'm using OBS uh, based on my extensive Twitch profile. Not really, but uh, anyways, I use this uh, streaming software, which allows me to just record my audio visual feeds. So what you see on your Zoom screen is that's just gone 
on off into the ether. Anything that happens there is just gone. I'm recording what I'm talking about onto my computer in hopes that the software doesn't crash. And that means that anything you say over Zoom or show yourself all that is not actually going to be recorded. If you would like a uh, lecture question recorded, it's going to go into this lecture questions box right here. If you're uncomfortable with that, I'm thinking maybe you, I can let you uh, DM me or something like that, uh, any questions that you might have. So uh, yeah, and so you won't be able to see Discord until you've changed your name uh, to your real name. And uh, that means that I have to go through and then manually add you to students. So if that's the theory, uh, it should be working on practice. So once your name is your real name, I'll usually come over and add your role to uh, students. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to answer, just throw your hand up in uh, Zoom and you, know, you can pop your hand up and that'll give me a little note there and you can just ask it orally and I will do that and it will vanish off into nothing. It's like we were never here. All right, so uh, given all that, book. I am clicking like a fool. Um, next thing is about Zoom. Uh, Zoom is where we'll be doing our watching and listening of content. You can raise your hand and ask questions. Oh my gosh, I'm like totally repeating things here. Uh, I'm going to be basically disabling or otherwise ignoring chat based on my limited experience with first year students in chat in Zoom. I really don't want to engage with it anymore. I mean, yeah, I appreciate you. Anyways, but yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh, and so I have this lecture questions channel here uh, that'll pop up right here. People can see the questions you ask, give people a thumbs up. Uh, that's fantastic. And um, I am sort of adding people into roles as they go. So um, I want to start out with some getting to know you questions. Uh, these are run through ePoll. So uh, if you log into ePoll.serve.ualberta.ca and hit code BWN, I can start to ask some questions here. And I'm going to unleash the poll. And you all should be it's working. People are alive. Uh, that's fantastic. So I'm going to get some questions in. Now, these ePoll questions form part of your participation grade. So this is just the way to encourage it. They are graded on an effort only basis. Uh, I excuse 10% of them automatically. So if you find yourself completely knocked out and miss some time, that's fine. If you're knocked out for a long period of time, you can fill out the excused absence form on, e on our e-class and then I'll just prorate your scores accordingly. So don't worry about it. Uh, this is really there just to get you to kind of commit and engage. I'm a big believer in kind of what I call this gymnasium theory of um, uh, education, where basically it's the going and doing that's important. And this is a bit of a social activity. So committing you to do that uh, makes that really uh, important. So, uh, all right, so we've got our e-poll all done and I can share that with you. The theory is I'll click this button. <gasps> There it is, it's fantastic. So we see that most people are in their third and fourth years of their program, according to the poll of ease. Okay, uh, so, oh, hey, and then people can jump stuff around. I love it. Okay, um, fantastic. So if we head on back, we can uh, I'll close that e-poll, cease and desist. Um, then I can ask you this next question which is what is the highest level astro course that you've taken? So I'll pop that in. If you've taken no formal courses, that's fine. Go ahead, click that. Uh, if you've taken like Astro 101 or Black Holes MOOC, let me know. Uh, if you've taken one of our first year courses, that's answer C. Oh, shoot, Astro 320, that should be 320. So if you've taken our STARS course, uh, go ahead and answer D. And if you've actually somehow, you know, hopped around a bit and taken a 400 level course or higher or you're enrolled in it now, go ahead and click on that right, right there. So this is just to get a sense of where people are coming from. And I want to stress that you don't have to have taken an astro course here. We are going to shake and bake everything you need to know about astronomy right here uh, in this course. Uh, we're going to come at it from a slightly different perspective. So a lot of stuff is going to seem familiar, but we're going to kind of bring it in a new uh, direction here. So I'm going to uh, close this and hop on over to our next question, which is, I'd like to know, um, 
Yep. Uh, what you think of online person, uh, uh, online classes? Do you like online classes more than in person? Uh, I, there's there's a there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, for online, and there's a lot of enthusiasm for what the heck are we doing? And I think it's really a matter of personal preference. Some people do really well. Some people don't. Some people just pick E because it's not there. And hey, I'm going to click pick E because that's on E poll, and I'm good with that. These are you know effort only at this point. So uh, I'll give you all a couple more seconds and awesome. Let's call that that. All right, um, so we can hop on over here to our browser and see that, you know, we've got uh, a little bit of online, a little bit of, uh, you know, in person, a little bit of meh, and a surprisingly disturbingly large amount of I'm so burnt out I couldn't even care. This was a super short winter break, I feel like. Oh. I think just mathematically it was. So yeah, here we are. So hopping back. Um, the next thing I wanted to do is I posted this introductory video, mostly because people join late, they can still get the full syllabus lecture. Uh, almost all of the content's based in the syllabus and sort of an explanation of what's gonna happen there. And I want to take a quick pause now to see if people had questions of, um, had questions about the content or the structure of the course. If you haven't had a chance to watch the syllabus video, that's cool. Uh, it's linked off of the e-class, go straight to a YouTube video, and we'll you know, just catch up. It just goes over the usual how I'm gonna run the course. But if you had any questions, hit me up with them now. Not much. So, oh, there's one coming maybe through the Discord, but I'm a big believer in the long, awkward pause when I ask questions because I legit want you to ask questions. Sort of the deal. Uh, so that's that's the thing is that, you know, nothing is as disheartening as a professor's like, is there any questions? Onward. Uh, because, you know, you haven't realized you had a question yet. So seriously, you know, put a pause, throw it in the lecture if you have anything. And if anything comes up, hit me up over email. Almost all of the course logistics stuff is best done over email. I kind of view Discord as the thing that you want to use when we're just kind of chatting about course content. If you have a question about your grade, flip it onto email, uh, catch me there. Okay. Well, we are, uh, Kind of whipping through things. Uh, okay, so a few logistical points as we get, uh, before we get right into content here. First off, uh, for this Friday, uh, there's this software that I'm going to try to use. This is an experiment, haven't really worked this all out yet, uh, but it's called Glue. And what Glue is, is it's a multi-dimensional data visualization package, which is super useful for what we're going to be doing. Um, and we'd like for you to try to download and open up Glue on a computer you'll be using. That way you'll kind of be able to follow along on Friday activities at home. Uh, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and post them into uh, the Discord and get going. It should run on Mac and Windows as a standalone application. And then you can, if you're a Python user, you can install it through Anaconda. Um, here. So we got a question of, is it the same as AWS Glue or different? Uh, so Glue is the visualization package. I think there's an AWS sort of, uh, sort of middleware layer called Glue, but I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. So this is kind of a smaller data package that's used in astrophysics. So I think it's different. Link is on um, the web page, and that'll take you to kind of some install notes. I'd like to give it a try. If things go completely pear-shaped on your particular install, uh, all the exercises we'll be engaging in can be done on a spreadsheet, but uh, there's a reason why Excel isn't used for astronomical data analysis, and uh, you will be working with a far smaller amount of data as a result uh, from that. It's fine. 
will we, we will deal with Excel or Google Sheets uh, accordingly. But I really like to try to use this glue just because it's nifty and it makes almost all the stuff that we would have to do uh, fast. So uh, next Friday, so not this Friday, but the following Friday, uh, we have a bit of a homework assignment due. And if you, you know, become a student, that's me. Look at me, I'm a student. Uh, and hop on down here. You'll find that I've posted a PDF of the homework here uh, with you know long blah 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 instructions, bunch of a uh, bunch of assumptions and stuff, and then some stuff that kind of covers material that we'll be going over today, a little bit on Friday, and then on Monday. Um, and so I hope to give you some time with that. When you're done, you can hop on in. I bet you you are a zillion times more familiar with this particular package than I am. This is this assigned to package. And you can just upload uh, images in here. And then our grader slash me can look at your um, stuff and uh, go ahead and assign you marks for it. So that's the theory. Uh, as I said, First time lecturing, so uh, yeah, if this goes pear-shaped, go ahead and uh, let me know and I'll try to get it sorted out. Um, the other thing is, is that I usually post, I'm going to try to post the PDFs of the slides that I'll be using uh, on here. So if you're the kind of person who likes to have a tablet or something and just annotate as you go, I'll be chucking them up there. It means that you won't be surprised by any of the ePoll questions, but we'll, you know. <sighs> Life, life surprises are becoming less and less uh, thrilling these days. Uh, okay, so given all of that, uh, let's hop on into uh, a bit about observational astrophysics. So uh, in astro, there's largely two camps. There is on one side, uh, the theoretical astrophysics course. And this is really exemplified by our Astronomy 320 course, which is about stellar astrophysics. This is a first principles. We know a ton about physics. We're going to sit down and through the power of pure thought, just come up with what a star looks like. Okay, this is it. It's round. It's magnetic. It's, you know, it's not magnetic. It's self-gravitating. Boom! There's a star. I can tell you everything about how it evolves. And uh, in the next chapter of material, we're going to go ahead and learn a little bit about uh, uh, the outcomes of that theoretical work. Super cool and amazing. Uh, but the way we do astrophysics isn't really necessarily from the theory, it's we actually look at space. And what we've done is we've assumed that physics describes space uh, effectively. So we have this fundamental assumption that the same laws of physics operate throughout our visible universe. And because of that, we uh, sort of say, okay, I can use my laws of gravitation to understand how, you know, neutron stars are going to spiral in and collide into each other and make these kilonova events, for example. And so what that means is uh, we need something to compare our theoretical models to. And so that's our observational astrophysics. And it's this kind of other side of the coin. And so what I've tried to do here is in this course, I'd like to kind of explore what the, astro the observational side of astrophysics looks like. And what that means is that means that we'll be dealing a bit more with real astronomical data in this class. And we'll be saying, well, does this data support our theory? So in a very real way, this is like an astro laboratory class. Uh, we're going to be dealing with like the tele details of telescopes and why we have a stupid magnitude system and stuff like that. Because that's going to allow us to engage with the observational data. And since we'll have all of this observational data, that means that uh, we're going to start to explore a little of the tools that we use and we're going to use real data. So we are going to get stuff that was collected in the past few years. Some of it will be as old as 20 years. but We'll get that, and we'll basically do the same science that you see in uh, textbooks. Um, a little word on textbooks is one of the reasons why I'm just plowing on and writing a new textbook is that all the books that I have in the field, like that big orange book you have, a lot has changed in galactic astrophysics over the past 20 years. And, you know, I study galactic astrophysics. And so I read this and I'm just like, well, this has omitted tons of really important information. So what I want to do is kind of give you what modern astrophysics looks like from a data intensive perspective. And this is just going to be kind of a hint 
of like how the data work, but I want you to get you know familiar with actually what the data side of uh, astronomy looks like. And this is actually how we do research. So this is going to be a very kind of research adjacent course. Uh, and so that's, you know, the, the theme for the course uh, is going to focus around observational astrophysics and trying to understand uh, galaxies. So we've understood all of these additional uh, features in astrophysics using these things that we call messengers. I go, Ooh, that's exciting. I'm, I'm very thrilled with technology. Uh, and so what's happening here is we want to learn how we interrogate the universe. We look out and say, does our theory explain this amount of messenger? Do we see the right kind of light? Do we see appropriate particles from this event? Do we see gravitational waves? Can we explain all of these things from the messengers we receive? And really, we're stuck here on Earth. Uh, so far as a species, yeah, we're not exactly conquering space anytime soon. We're trying hard, but you know, but yeah, space is big and we're tiny. So what we got to do is wait for the information from the universe to come to us and the messengers are what bring it to us. By far, 99.5%, I don't know, some huge 99 and several nines uh, bit of information about the universe that we see comes from light. You, familiar based on how you filled in your poll with the idea of light as this electromagnetic wave. And uh, we know that light in a vacuum, because space is very close to a vacuum, and we'll put a couple asterisks uh, beside that as appropriate, but uh, light in a vacuum follows the dispersion relationship that you see here, this C equals lambda, and we'll use nu as a frequency in this class, not an F, we've got that variable coming later. Uh, so we use C equals lambda nu, and C is this canonical speed of light in a vacuum. So this is uh, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, uh, and you probably already know that, which means that you've memorized one of the 13 numbers that I would really like you to know by your heart of hearts as you go through this class. Uh, lambda is the wavelength of that wave, nu is the frequency, and that kind of gives us everything we need to know about light, but we give it words. Uh, those words are that we separate them into chunks of light based on the electromagnetic spectrum. And that electromagnetic spectrum, here's a graphic I stole from the fine folks at NASA, and uh, we basically describe light based on any of its properties. Uh, the wavelength, uh, which in the dispersion relationship. Using that dispersion relation, I can interrelate it to its frequency. And then finally, uh, I can relate it to its energy. Uh, and here, energy refers to the energy of a single photon uh, when I'm describing it this way. And so you've probably been exposed to the different wave bands in astrophysics. Uh, those are up here. We uh, call you know gamma rays and x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, this is fun, visible, microwave, and radio. Uh, these components are what are the uh, sort of broad descriptions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And what that means is we're going to be able to um, kind of describe uh, light based on these broad words. And, you know, you can look it up at any point, but you should have a general sense of how these wave bands relate to each other uh, if you don't already. And then we'll start to get a little, you know, quantitative uh, with these values. The energy here is the energy of a single photon. That's a particle of light. And uh, the energy of a single photon is given by this uh, quantum relationship that the uh, energy is equal to uh, h nu, uh, where h is Planck's constant, another one of your 13 values. Uh, so it's 6.63 times 10 to the 8th, 34 joule seconds. And given the reality of how tiny Planck's constant is, we often express the energies of individual photons in terms of units of electron volts. Those electron volts are just another repunctuation of uh, energy spectrum, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, joules. And so this allows us to do calculations uh, of what is the energy of a given photon uh, so a classic example you might see in this class, 
Do I have that on the homework? Maybe even have something like this on the homework. Is red light has a wavelength of 700 nanometers. What's the energy of a red photon in EV? And so I can, uh, oops. Yeah, don't look at my pre-work. I, you know, this this may look like it's completely uh, a uh, crap show and improv, but sometimes I have to do my math beforehand. There is never. Mind. There, there is nothing more embarrassing than uh, screwing up simple algebra in front of a university class. So we say that energy is equal to h nu for a single photon, and then we use that dispersion relationship to say that uh, nu is equal to c over lambda, and so we get nu is hc over lambda, and then we just plug in the values that we have, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules dot seconds, and here's the point in the class where you realize that my handwriting is craptacular. I'm sorry, it's, uh, you know, I don't know who to blame. I blame myself. Anyways, yeah, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. I explained to my wife that 90% of the questions I get in class are, what does that say? Um, but ooh. don't press that button. Okay, and then I just plug in the wavelength. So a nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters, so we have 700 times 10 to the minus nine uh, meters. And then if we uh, grind that all out, you get a result that is 2.84 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And you know that that's right at that characteristic energy scale of an electron volt. So it's often useful to say, okay, I'm going to multiply that by the conversion factor of 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 joules is equal to one electron volt. And that gives me a result of 1.8 EV. And if I'm being finicky about significant figures, that would be two EV because there was only one in that 700 uh, that came in here. Uh, it's worth noting that this bundle of constants, hc, uh, is, this, is, this isn't one of your numbers, but I often use that hc is equal to 1240 ev dot nanometers, which is really useful in the optical part of the spectrum. Whew. All right, uh, I'll take a pause there, let people shout at me if there's any uh, concerns or issues. I'll post uh, I'll post the video so you can see this, and ooh, yeah, I'll make sure that you can see all the parts there. Oh. <clears throat> okay, well, that was a hoot. Uh, light is something that I teach it in Physics 124, so I'm pretty sure that you fine students of physics have seen a lot about it. Um, we see a little less in terms of what particles look like. And so particles um, that we receive here on Earth are just that. So these tend to be single uh, subatomic particles that come into our atmosphere. And there's kind of two flavors of these. The first, and by far the dominant one, is called uh, the solar wind. And so our sun has the uh, magnetic field and that magnetic field has to kind of couple out into space. And this, uh, given we have a high pressure, uh, high temperature body underneath entrained in a magnetic field, this creates a magnetohydrodynamically driven flux of particles out from the surface of the sun. It essentially drives it outward uh, based on needing to kind of close all of the uh, sort of electromagnetic uh, field lines around the sun, it sort of sucks off and more pushes out uh, the particles from the sun. And this gives us a flux of protons, some electrons, and helium uh, nuclei, so sometimes I'll call those alpha particles, that get blown off of the surface of the sun, crash through the uh, inner solar system at kilometers per second, uh, and then, you know, come, you know, impinging onto the surface of uh, the atmosphere of the Earth, giving us this fine, you know, aurora, which maybe we'll get some this winter. Uh, and so that's, you know, the heart of it. But more interesting from the perspective of messenger astrophysics are these things that we call cosmic rays. So what cosmic rays do is that these are relativistic particles, and they basically have to be relativistic because otherwise they couldn't get here from anywhere else in a reasonable amount of time. 
and they have to be able to penetrate into the solar system. And if they have low energies, their gyro radii in the solar magnetic field are super tiny. And so then they just kind of get deflected out and scrambled up. And it's, you know, it's just this uh, proton that you find in space. And, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot of protons in space. So the, they need to be relativistic. And when we express something in relativity, uh, we usually write down its energy here in um, uh, EV. So this uh, is a graph of the flux of uh, cosmic ray particles onto the surface of the Earth, written in these crazy units of uh, per meter squared, per star radian, per second, per GeV. We'll learn a bit about the why those flux units are written so strangely as we go forward into the future. Uh, but basically, and then the energy down here is an expression where we have that the energy is equal to gamma mc squared, where gamma is the Lorentz. You can't see that very well. Yeah, so gamma is the Lorentz gamma, Lorentz factor which is one over root one minus V squared over C squared. And for that to be anything, eh, eh, well, we write it up here. Gamma is equal to one over square root of one minus V squared over C squared. And for that to be significant, that means that these things have to be uh, traveling close to the speed of light. And for reference, uh, this value uh, here, 10 to the 9 uh, is a giga electron volt, or a GeV, and one of our favorite truisms is that the mass energy of a proton is about a GeV. And so these things are just trans-relativistic right here. So this is, uh, I'll just note that E over C squared for these particles is about the mass of a proton uh, here or mass of a hydrogen atom. They're indistinguishable, really. Uh, so this gives us uh, relativistic particles coming in, and uh, I, I personally find it a little spooky and disturbing that this scale goes all the way up to 10 to the 21, eh, which you can't see behind the lecture questions. And, and there's significant numbers of 10 to the 20, 10 to the 21, uh, EV particles coming in, and I like to sort of twiddle that out. I do it in the book that, you know, a tennis ball served at, you know, tens of kilometers an hour has about the same energy as one proton coming in at this flux. So the origin of these super ultra high energy cosmic rays uh, are... You know, it's 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 an interesting question that we're still we, we have some ideas for. We'll talk about these things later in the class and their origins. Uh, but the cosmic rays here uh, are accelerated by something in space. We'll learn about. It'll crash through the solar magnetic field, hit into Earth, and um, you know basically uh, you know be these high energy particles crashing into us. Uh, yeah. There's some time I'll tell you about uh, cancer and life expectancies of airline flight attendants and their relationship to cosmic rays. It's, um, yeah, it's disturbing. Space wants to kill us. Uh, finally, it's worth noting, uh, there are these things called neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos, which you have probably heard about in the context of particle physics. Uh, these are light neutral particles that are weakly interacting, meaning they interact through the weak nuclear force. And things that are weak uh, nuclear force means that they are very unlikely to interact with regular matter, but not, you know, nonetheless a uh, some probability. So they penetrate very deep uh, through matter. Uh, the sort of stopping depth of a typical new, uh, uh, neutrino in matter is some disturbingly large fraction of a light year's thickness of lead. Uh, if you want to stop any given neutrino. But there are lots of neutrinos out there 
floating through space, and that rare interaction means that we detect it. Uh, this is a bit of a University of Alberta hobby, um, or not hobby. It is totally a major theme of the physics department research uh, through the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. Uh, we have a lot of connections there, and uh, they're you know literally Nobel Prize winning work in demonstrating that those neutrinos have non-zero mass, and that's uh, very exciting because it kind of doesn't make sense, and it points to particle physics not being a solved problem. Uh, the next thing to talk about uh, are gravitational waves. And this is one of those things that's just not in modern, uh, uh, the modern textbooks that we can, and why we need to write around, is that gravitational waves are a relatively recent discovery. Uh, they were discovered in, well, I shouldn't say discovery. They were predicted as a consequence of Einstein's theory of general relativity way back in 1915. And they're generated by bodies uh, that are engaged in orbital motion around each other. And uh, something moving, a massive object moving through space-time creates a distortion of space-time. And if that distortion has uh, a quadrupolar moment, uh, a changing quadrupole moment, it will, uh, like two bodies orbiting around each other, what this means is that it will produce radiation uh, in the space, basically, the fabric of space-time that propagates outward at the speed of light. And these gravitational distortions can be detected because we can basically measure the distances between objects very carefully. And if those distances change, uh, then uh, consistent with a gravitational wave passing by, then we know that those uh, pieces are uh, undergoing a distortion through gravita uh, a gravitational wave. So this is much more difficult than just taking a meter stick and saying, did it get shorter? Uh, and so this is executed through the Laser Interferometer Gravitational, I think, Wave Observatory, or LIGO. Uh, there are a pair of observatories in Washington State and uh, Hanford. Uh, no, Hanford's Washington, and I think it's Louisiana. But, you know, two locations in the United States. And then a second one, a uh, third one that has been brought online in Europe. And then there are progressively more coming online. And they have been detecting since about 2015 uh, major gravitational wave distortions. Um, they start out, they discover these sort of disturbingly large black holes collapsing into each other. But from the perspective of actual astrophysics, the uh, major result from a gravitational wave observatory was this thing that's called GW170817, which is a neutron star merger. We'll talk a bit about neutron stars as we get into the class later. But uh, they spiral around each other. They lose radiation because of, uh, lose energy because of gravitational wave radiation. That causes their orbital major axes to get smaller and smaller. They spiral in and then they crash into each other and it gives off this thing called a kilonova event. Not a supernova, and it's not a nova, and so kilonova was kind of something named as the intermediate energy scale between nova events and supernova, which are both very different astrophysical sources, but have kind of brightness uh, luminosities that bracket uh, this. So this kilonova uh, event exploded uh, off and was detected first through the gravitational wave in spiral, but then through electromagnetic counterparts, which is really pretty cool. Uh, so we saw both the gravitational wave and saw basically a flash of light across the spectrum that has been evolving for months and years after that. And when they did the spectroscopy of that light, they discovered it was very rich in heavy elements. And if it's this actually addressed a major question in astrophysics, which is where do the truly heavy elements come from? Uh, like uranium and your platinums and your xenons. Where do these come from? Standard stellar nucleosynthesis shouldn't necessarily give those uh, so easily. And there are a lot of weird theories about how this, but this turned out to basically say, nope, it's here. These things are making them. So if you have any of those heavy elements around, you can look at that and say, probably came from a binary neutron star merger. It's, you know, space, pretty cool. All right, so given these messengers, 
Observational astrophysics needs to make a measurement of how we receive them. And the baseline description for how we understand light uh, is through this quantity that we call the flux. And we measure the flux of light here on Earth. And then we use our knowledge of the distance between us and the uh, objects that are far away to infer the luminosity. And so the luminosity is something that is measured in units of watts, so it's joules per second. And then the flux is a watt per unit area, or a watt per meter squared. And these are related by this inverse square law. So basically, the farther away from a source you get, uh, the fainter it appears. And we describe that as falling off. And the, the scaling is essentially uh, this inverse square law that you see right here, where the luminosity is the total power. And this 4 pi d squared running around right down here, this is the area of a sphere, surface area of a sphere. So you take that power and you smear it out over the entire surface and you get this relationship uh, that says that the flux of light we receive is all of the power spread over all of the surface area that it could possibly go through. So this allows us to calculate properties of distant objects. For example, the sun. So you can use, you can use the luminosity, oh, sorry, the flux, flux is equal to the luminosity over 4 pi times the distance to an object squared to estimate what the luminosity of the sun is. And so at this point, I'm going to take a break, shut up finally, and let you uh, sort of just uh, punch through and uh, come up with that. And I will liberate the e-poll right here. Um, so you should have an open e-poll question, and you can try this out. All right, I got uh, 23 or so responses. Okay, so we're we're coming in. Um, yeah, and that's about the number of people we have here in class. So, uh, yeah, let's let's call it. We've reached the point where if you're still working, type in something randomly. Because you know that's a point no matter what. So let's see how we did here. Close that up see what we got. All right. Wow. Holy Toledo. Look at all these amazing answers. I love it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so just very briefly, because I am not seeing a lot of uh, concerns here. Uh, so I will just say that you algebraically solve this, and we will say that the luminosity is 4 pi d squared times f. Okay, actually unmuted. That's awesome. Uh, and then I just plug in numbers. 4 pi distance to the uh, Earth 
to the sun, 4.9 times 10 to the 11th meters, uh, known to all its greatest fans as an astronomical unit. Uh, and then we multiply that by the flux, which is 1,365. My hand got ahead of me. Watts per meter squared. And you grind that out, you get 3.81 times 10 to the 26 watts, which is a metric crap ton of energy. Uh, this is very close to the International Astronomical Unit, uh, in International Astronomical Union, IAU, definition for one solar luminosity, which is 3.83 times 10 to the 26 watts. And that is uh, what I am hoping that you will have in your head by next Friday. So the slight, slight difference here is because of lack of precision and me using a slightly outdated value of the um, uh, solar constant here. Anyways, so that's uh, the result there. Were there any questions? I am not seeing anything emerging here on the Zoom. Okay, uh, I'll take the last few minutes here in our fine class to talk about the next piece. Oops, pay no attention to that. Uh, the next piece here is that we, our, our notion of flux really didn't care about what kind of light we received at all. It's blue light, red light, infrared, gamma rays, didn't matter that much energy. And so to describe how flux is related to the color, uh, we just use this quantity that we call the flux density, which is essentially the flux of light per unit wavelength or frequency or energy, since algebraically all three of those things are equivalent uh, in one way or another. Uh, but the because wavelength and frequency increase in opposite directions across the electromagnetic spectrum, it matters whether you care that something is per unit wavelength or per unit frequency. And so what this means is that we do have to be very careful about what this density is in terms of. And this is very much a density. You know what a mass density is. You know, I don't know, you may work with energy densities. This is basically a power density per unit wavelength that's coming in. And so if it's a density, it needs to be integrated to yield a physically meaningful quantity. Like if I tell you something is 10 kilograms per meter cubed, you can't measure 10 kilograms per meter cubed, you measure 10 kilograms, you measure a meter cubed, and then you form that ratio. To figure out how much a physical me measurement is, you got to integrate it. You have to add it up to find out a real power coming out here. And we just define a flux density using a relationship that looks like this, which is basically the same uh, for wavelength, uh, except the bounds on the integral are in terms of wavelength. And so what we have is something here. Uh, and so the last thing I'll say about this is that a unit of flux density is called, uh, well, there are many different units of flux density, but you will often see one in astrophysics called a Jansky. Uh, is named after a pioneer of radio astronomy, and a characteristic radio source has this kind of a flux density. One Jansky is 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter squared per hertz, where a hertz is you know, a unit of frequency. And so in the book, I twiddle through an example of how much power you receive from radio sources. Secret answer, not a lot. Okay. And I'll close today by just sort of noting that when you make a plot of flux density versus wavelength or energy or frequency, this is what we call uh, a spectrum. So it's a measurement of the amount of light we are receiving as a function of wavelength, energy, or frequency. So uh, this is an example of a spectrum. This is shown, this is the star Vega, which is astronomically really important, and we'll get into why in like a lecture or two. Uh, but this plot of Vega shows the amount of light that we receive in units of what the heck? All right, so these things are 
The other thing that you get to learn about observational astrophysics is we have crazy units and stupid conventions. And so I always say that 90% of observational astronomy is learning what the stupid units are. Uh, and this is uh, this particular uh, unit of ill repute. This is an angstrom. An angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer. And then an erg up here is 10 to the minus 7 joules. It's the CGS unit of energy. And so uh, we, you probably know what a centimeter squared is and all that. Those are fine, but you know, what the heck is an erg um, and all that stuff. So these are weird CGS units, but critically, you can look at this and see that this is a plot of uh, wavelength as, uh, and this is about 420 nanometers. So that's about the blue. Uh, part of the spectrum. All right, so at this point, I'm going to wrap things up. It's uh, 1.50, and on Friday, we'll get back together, and we'll actually uh, start working a little bit with observational data from the Gaia satellite mission. Uh, for now, I'll say thanks a lot for uh, tuning in. I'll be posting this up onto eClass and or uh, YouTube, and so then we'll be able to watch and review as you see fit. Uh, but I have stolen enough of your life so far. Uh, thanks for watching. And I'm going to shut off the recording now. So if you want to ask me any questions about class logistics or whatever, uh, I'll be here or on the Discord for a little while. See you later.